Hi, Denny Boynton here again in the fishbowl uh, at TechEd Developer 2008 for ArtCast. Uh, my guest is Juval Lowy with iDesign. Thank you very much for joining me today. Hello, in Danny. The in the fishbowl. Pleasure um, to be here, yeah, as always. This is, this is, this is also called uh, Interview by Distraction. So um, <laughs> there's no ceiling. Uh, anyway, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Juval, for those who may not know you. So I'm the principal of iDesign, where we specialize in built-in architecture consulting. We do a fair amount of advanced training on technologies like WCF. Mm -hmm. I'm also the Microsoft Regional Director for the Silicon Valley. I participate in the internal design reviews at Microsoft, your future version of .NET. I was part of the strategic design effort for C Sharp mm -hmm. and for WCF. I published a few books. This one is Programming WCF Services. I write a lot of magazine articles. I write white papers for MSDN. I write the WCF column for MSDN magazine. Um, I speak at a conference here. In fact, mm -hmm. I co-chaired with Microsoft the SOA track for TechEd 2008. Oh, okay, okay. So if someone didn't know who you were, that would seem kind of strange. They wouldn't be here, I think. You're rather ubiquitous. <laughs> 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 so uh, later this afternoon, you're delivering a talk here on interface-driven design and development. Right. And it was interesting when I was looking at your content for your talk, one of the first slides in your deck was um, OO has basically failed us. Now, I've talked for a long time about the concept of right-sizing OO because I've seen you know true OO implementations that have just gone completely off the rails. Um, but I thought it was interesting when your slide said OO has failed us. And you know, well, why, why don't we start there? Why, why has OO failed us? Actually, to begin with, uh, the reason actually we are having this talk is because the architecture track wanted me to actually have a session purely on .NET interfaces and working with interfaces, tr trying to rekindle the lights of how to properly uh, decouple systems using interfaces, mm -hmm. because most developers who haven't experienced the last 12 years of software development simply don't understand these issues and tend to take the easy way out. Mm -hmm. and why, so why, uh, let me interrupt you there real quick. Why, why is that, do you suppose? Why do you think that that developers have lost their way as far as the you know, building well, I mean, interfaces? If you look at specific issue of interfaces, there's a pendulum. So if you look at C++, C++ had no concept of interfaces whatsoever. Right. Mm -hmm. Then COM came along, everything was interface based. You can never see the object. There's this big interface shield, you program against the interface, right? Dot .NET comes along, it's wishy-washy. I mean, there is interfaces, nobody's holding your foot to the fire. Mm -hmm. WF, WCF comes along, slap everybody back to formation. You have to use this interface, it's called contracts, mm -hmm. right? Um, if you take a glimpse of what's coming after that, uh, the pendulum's probably going to swim back. So. Why are we swinging like this? I mean, if and, and my current thinking is that it skips generations because there's a generation that actually does things wrong and they learn from the mistakes and do it right, but then the new generation coming along don't really appreciate that and tend to revert back to the old way. Right. Like this is why it skips generations. Mm okay, okay. Um, but going back to your original question about why OO is a failure, it failed on its promise of reuse. Meaning, if you were to do a survey amongst developers, how many of them actually used an object from anybody else, a true business object, I'm not talking about nuts and bolts like a string class, an actual business object with features and value to the customer, took an object as is, no strings attached from anybody else and ever used it, the answer would be zero. Nobody ever used anything from anybody else. Mm -hmm. And that's not a surprise because in real life, objects are inherently unreliable, un unreusable. They are utilitarian, they are designed for be to be used in a particular context. In any given system, the only, in the only element of reuse is the interface of the thing, not the thing itself. Mm, okay. And this subtle distinction is what made OO, at the end, a big failure. This is why, ever since the late 80s, we have not been using OO. We've been using uh, DLLs and components, and then uh, runtime with components and so on. OO on its own simply doesn't cut it. And that's probably the single most uh, uh, detrimental factor on what makes OO be uh, inadequate. Okay. There's other things like source code reuse and other things that OO fails and inability to make remote calls. I mean, it's all things that you can actually solve very nicely by having interfaces mm -hmm. as opposed to programming against the actual object. Okay, well, let's, let's dig into that a little bit. So if that is the problem, how, do, how does the interface-centric des uh, inter interface, uh, design and development, how does that solve the problem? When you program against an interface, you program against an abstraction of a service as opposed to the actual service. And it turns out that's not, a qu that's not a quality of software engineering, it's a quality of engineering in general. That's simply how the way the universe operates. Mm -hmm. When you plug something into something else, you don't really care about the making of that thing as long as it complies with a certain interface. For example, I'm sitting here on a couch. Now, I don't really care 
how much this couch cost and what is its color or how much it weighs as long as it supports my weight comfortably I'm happy to use it mm -hmm. and so if you look at this cushion this cushion probably could not be put on any other couch in the universe besides this couch it's designed for this couch you agree about it? it can, you can't put it on the chair over there mm -hmm. right it's designed for this no, couch it's too wide it would, yep. too wide, too mm -hmm. narrow, too high mm -hmm. um, the colors wouldn't match whatever it is it wouldn't match this pillow was designed for this couch but the interface sit butt is well defined so I can sit on this couch and you can sit on this couch right so we're merely using the facet that we care about which is the interface sit butt right and so once you start thinking about it that way you see it everywhere mm -hmm. right that's how the world is put together and good software always tries to mimic the world and the better the the affinity to the real world the better off your design and trying to insist that the element of reuse is the object as opposed to the interface of the object leads to basically unreusable things. Mm -hmm. okay. And so if you look at technologies like COM, the designers of COM in the early 90s acutely realized that and therefore they f lay down the law. You can only see the object. You can only see the interface. You mm -hmm. never see the actual object behind it. Mm -hmm. Now it turns out that COM had significant issues. None of it got to do with the idea. Uh, I said that COM was unnecessarily ugly because the language you used to develop it was C++, which simply wasn't interface-oriented or component-oriented. And COM was bolted on top of Windows, so the platform didn't know anything about COM. So the overall experience was just too ugly. So with the next iteration of the platform, Microsoft had the service-oriented language, uh, had the component-oriented language, which is C Sharp, that knows about interfaces, and had a platform that knows about interfaces, which is the CLR. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, two kinds of developers came into the mix. There were developers who experienced COM and understood the benefit of interfaces and those who haven't. So with .NET, it's, you know, it's loosey-goosey. You want to use interfaces? You want to separate the right. interface implementation? Yep. Go ahead. Yep. Give, you, give you the rope and hope you don't hang yourself. Yep. Now, if you look at Microsoft, what it's doing, everything is based on interfaces. The integer alone supports like 17 different interfaces, right? And the form supports another set of interfaces. It's all based on interfaces, mm -hmm. but always holding your foot to the fire. As a result, developers end up programming against objects and against the actual class, not against the interface of the class. And this lack of indirection simply not enabling them later on to change the service provider. If you program just against the interface, you only have one line that couples you to the actual object. It's new, blah, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can have millions of lines of code that don't really change if you change right. blah. Now, even blah can be encapsulated in a class factory, which means your code has zero impact by changing the service provider. That's the whole idea behind what thinks that Com did at the time, not WCF is doing for you. If you only program against interface, you can also program against against a proxy that would forward the call to another processor or another machine. You can gain scalability, redundancy, availability. You can have scenarios that vendors talk to other vendors, like I'm plugging control on a form. I mean, how could you possibly take a user control that has never seen my form and plug it over there? It's mm -hmm. because there's a agreed upon set of interfaces that say how those things interact. The form never programmed against the actual control. It programs against I, control, host, view, whatever these interfaces are. And so that is how you build modular, extensible, reusable, well-designed system. But even if you look at codes coming today from Microsoft, they tend to cut the corner. They don't go the extra step. They program against apps or classes, not against classes, not against interfaces. And so overall, that's the wrong way of doing things. Mm -hmm. So especially if you move from .NET, classic .NET to the world of WCF, now the pendulum is on the other side. You have to program against an interface. It's called a contract. You never see the actual object. Mm -hmm. That's the way it should be. Now I suspect we're going to see um, similar uh, kind of uh, developers that can't really grasp that. And so even in WCF, you can actually slap the service contract attribute directly on the, on the service class. But that's wrong because you're programming in effect against the right. object mm -hmm. again. Yep. So I see that the fact that something can be done doesn't mean that it should be done. Right? Um, I tend to be more strict here. I'd like to see interfaces everywhere. I mean, taken to the ultimate conclusion, you should never program against any objects. I mean, maybe against nuts and bolts like strings and integers, it's okay to program against the primitives because those will never change. We will mm -hmm. never have another integer. Right. right. It's right, okay right. to play. But with normal business objects, you can never make the guarantee that you will never, ever, 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 ever make a change or switch the provider. <laughs> so right. why are you pretending that this actually is never going to take place? Well, we know, we acknowledge that it's going to take place. Mm -hmm. Program against an abstraction of it. Mm -hmm not against the actual implementation. And that's basically the, the message I'm trying to convey in about an hour from now in that session you mentioned. So it's so what it really is so it, what I'm hearing you say is is you have 
the best practices that you would have in a service-oriented type of architecture where you have the interface of the service and it, it, it can abstract, you know, it, it could be a composite service that's making calls out to other things. All of that is... Correct. Is it's a black box. That boundary is, is, is explicit Correct. and, 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 and you know, shouldn't be penetrated by the outside. You're saying take that into the world of building local components as well. Absolutely. In yeah. fact, that's what component-oriented software is all about. In fact, my previous book, Programming Dotted Components, was all about the notion of separation of the interface from implementation and how do you design these components. Mm -hmm. Now, what service notation takes it to is a whole new level of saying not only can we separate the interface from the implementation, we can put a boatload of features in between and we can manage transactions for you and security and reliability and all that goodness. Mm -hmm. But even if I don't need transaction security reliability, I don't need anything WCF has to offer. Even at raw C sharp level, it is wrong to program against the object. Mm -hmm. Now certainly, if you program against interfaces, you're very well posed to move into the grand vision of service orientation. I mean, all power to you. Right. But it doesn't uh, I mean you shouldn't do it even at the most granular level. Mm -hmm. And the proof is in the pudding. This is exactly how .NET as a framework is put together. Right? Microsoft could have done it differently, but they chose not to. Right. Right? Now, what EX means I see code coming from pattern and practices or some framework developers and classes, people who do not understand these things. If you look, say, at the provider model for SP.NET or the persistence provider for WF or WCF, it's all based on abstract classes, which is dead wrong. I have more implementation of those providers. For example, I don't care about the whole asynchronous method, some other things. I have 20 messages and I'm throwing an exception, not implemented, not implemented, not implemented, because I have to derive from it. <laughs> and of course, it's an abstract class. Right. And of course, I derive from an abstract class, I have to actually say something. I'm saying not implemented, not implemented, not implemented. Yeah. This is just plain dumb. Mm -hmm. It should have been an I membership provider, I role provider, I persistence provider, I asynchronous persistence provider, different, well designated, well demarcated facets. I can choose to implement just a particular facet, not all of them. I mean, abstract classes are not designed to provide an implementation shield. They're designed to utilize inheritance as a way of specialization, which is not the same as a black box mechanism of reuse. Mm -hmm. it's, it's totally different. Yep. This is this, so what you're saying is resonating so much because uh, years ago, um, uh, it was actually the first time I saw um, Ron Jacobs talk about his his the, you know the four tenets of uh, of SOA and I don't I don't think he came up with those but that he was talking about them and I, I would go kind of take those tenets and it was it was a real strong evangelist for for service oriented architecture and and really just service design you know that, that that whole interface design and it was interesting because almost every place I went I would talk about what those tenets are and the best practices and people would come back and say you know that really makes sense for just about all software development absolutely they're they they're they're good practices because the goodness that you that that that, sir, that SOA kind of provides can now be Correct. enjoyed at a much more granular level. Correct. In fact, uh, I had a whole precon yesterday on on WCF and SOA, and the message from that day was taken to its ultimate conclusion: every class should be a service, and I actually even supported it with benchmarks and helper classes that make you achieve this utopian goal. Mm -hmm. But all the tenets of service orientation are things that hardcore, say, object-oriented developers have been doing since the 80s, mm -hmm. right? I mean, services are autonomous and boundaries are explicit. That's all saying, you know, information hiding is good, encapsulation is good, right. Right? decoupling is good. It's all different ways of saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, taken to the ultimate conclusion, why keep the benefits of SOA and the absolute boundaries of the big service? Take it down, make it more granular, right? right? Why keep it at that In grand between level? Between layers and even yeah. inside layers. And the key for all of that is using interfaces, mm -hmm. right? And so you don't have to actually bite the bullet of the grand vision of WCF and SOA to actually benefit from all the, the what the methodology has to offer. Mm -hmm. But the absolute linchpin, the key, is programming against interfaces, not against objects. That's great. That's great. I, and I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to get a chance to go see your talk today. I really want to learn, learn more about that. Um, you wrote a book last year. What was, what was the name of the book? It's called Programming WCF Services. It's uh, with O'Reilly. Okay. And it's all about how to design and build uh, WCF services. It's also how to extend WCF. I have more than 50 extensions and helper classes that tighten some loose screws and add features that weren't included in the product, even though they should have. And mm -hmm. I told them in the design review they should have. And uh, for reasons that are not related to the merit of the features, they didn't put it in. So I actually <laughs> I had to put it in myself. <laughs> Things yeah. like declarative security or tightening type safeties and so on. Or um, so most of the book is, you know, most of it, at least half of it is about how to extend what you can do with WCF and how to improve on the base experience because mm -hmm. there is, uh, the basic programming model is very simple. I mean, there is less to WCF programming than meets absolutely, the eye, Absolutely, right? yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, th there's hardly any syntax, in fact. I mean, it's all semantic. It's all how you put things together, mm -hmm. how you think about it, how you think what is right, what is wrong, what is the thought process that goes into developing one of these things. Right. 
Yeah, it's it, and that's it, it's brilliant because like I go out and talk about WCF to people, and they're like, okay, well, for my web services that'll work great. Now, what do I do for for message queuing? WCF. Yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> well, what if I want to do TCP/IP? D you know, try to explain that it really takes all those disparate right. I, channels fact, of. In fact, I say that WCF is nothing short of a better .NET. It's simply a superior programming ah, model. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, look at you declare a class, and then the class automatically becomes synchronized. You don't have to worry about synchronization. Mm -hmm. It jumps to the correct thread. It masks its own errors. It prevents client from calling it after an exception. It has tolerance with the data it needs to work with. All calls to it are encrypted. It authenticates all callers. Um, there's a ton of things that just kicked in the moment you declare a WCF class. None of it is visible inside the class. Nobody actually knows these things because as long right. as the program against the interface of the class, mm -hmm. you're still good. Right, right. right. So um, to me, WCF is, um, and I say it's a better .NET, it's actually a better C sharp. Because you still can utilize all the power of the .NET framework, all those 12,000 helper classes and mm -hmm. form this and all that. You can actually still use that, but the glue of putting it together is now a superior glue. Now, it's far from being a magic bullet. I mean, it's, it's just a better way of doing mm -hmm. things, but it doesn't take away the liability or the creativity yeah. and the need to do things right. It's a significant evolutional step forward. Absolutely. For sure. Okay. Juval, thanks so much for joining me today. My this pleasure. was a great, great conversation. I appreciate it. Uh, so, I'm Denny Boynton, uh, and uh, signing off here from the Fishbowl, and until next time, I'll see you on our cast.